Okay, so I'll just remind you of what the formula for conditional probability is. So for two events, A and B, um, okay, so this was the formula for conditional probability. And uh, this probability of A with a line in the middle and then B, the way you say that, so this is the probability of A given B. So this is kind of how you might say this in words. Basically what, what it, you know, kind of intuitively what this means is this is the probability that the event A occurs given that you already know B, that B occurs. Okay. okay. Um. <clears throat> One thing about this formula, so this formula is obviously good for computing the uh, conditional probability, right? But if I give you any two of these three uh, values, you can always solve for the third, right? So in particular, suppose I tell you this and I tell you that, or suppose you can, suppose you're able to easily compute, you know, this and that, then it gives you a good way to solve for the probability of A and B. So, so note, by rearranging, the equation, you get that the probability of both of the events happening, both of the events occurring, is equal to the probability that B occurs times the probability that A occurs given that B occurs. Or it's the probability of B times the probability of A given B. So I actually kind of think that the, the terminology here um, kind of makes like talking about probability of something given something. I feel like that kind of uh, it's kind of intuitive. So imagine you're trying to say, what's the probability that it's December and it's snowing? Right? You could say, well, first of all, we should compute what's the probability it's December. Well, that's kind of like roughly 1 over 12 because, I mean, if you pick a random day of the year, what's the probability it's December and snowing? It's, yeah, not exactly 1 over, it's 31 over 365, but it's roughly 1 over 12 chance of being December because you've got 12 months in the year. And then you could say, okay, if I already know it's now, so you want to compute the probability it's December, and then you want to say, given that it's December, like if we assume it's December, what's the probability it's snowing, right? And in Victoria, that's not a super high probability, but obviously it's higher than if it was August or something, right? Uh, so you want to say, like, what's the probability of one, one of these things happening, and then what's the probability of the second thing happening, given that the first thing Let's do an example. Oh, actually, first before I before I do an example, one thing I wanted to note is that this is kind of reversible. Like uh, I can write this as probability of A times probability of B given A, and this just follows by Rearrange, re rearranging the equation for the probability of B 
give it a name. So here we rearrange this equation, which was the equation for probability of A given B. And we just kind of switch these. That will become A. And if we rearrange, uh, we'll get this. So, so basically, if, you ever, if you're able to compute these two values, you can get this value. This is going to be kind of helpful when we're dealing with um, probability problems where, uh, well, where things are a little bit trickier than the ones we've been doing so far. So let me let me give you an example. Although, yeah, a lot of these problems can probably be solved in more than one way, but uh, we'll solve this problem using these formulas. So, uh, pick cards from a standard deck of cards so what is the probability that the first card We're picking, this is an ordered selection, we're picking one card, like we care about which one's first and which one's second. So I'm saying the first card is red, and the second is black. So, so actually, if you think about it, you, you actually can solve this using um, things we've already learned by thinking of all options being equally likely and, and stuff like that. But I want to solve this using conditional probability, just as a to give you a feel for how this works. So let E be the event that the first is red, um, F be the event that the second is black. So we're trying to compute the probability Computing the probability of some and statement, right? So it's the probability of the first is red and the second is black, which is the intersection of two events. Okay. So let's uh, let's use our um, our formulas. So you could write this as the probability of E times the probability of f given e. Okay. That's just using this kind of formula. It's just a and b that become e and f. What's the probability of e? Pick a card, any card. And uh, yeah, one half. One half, yeah. Because half the cards are red, right? And half a black. So, and just to, to really drive this home, like, I mean, this is one half, but let me just write this as 26 over 52, which is a half, right? So that really kind of justifies, you know, you've got 20, 26 of the cards are red, there's 52 in total. So it's the number of red ones over the total, right? Which is a half. Now here's a, here's a, I mean, this, this second part now requires you to really know what, what's going on with conditional probability. 
So imagine, imagine we picked a red card, we picked a card, and we already know, so this is given that E holds. So we picked a card, we already know the first one was red. So that's a given. So now when I choose the second one, what's the probability that it's black? 26 over 51. Yep, exactly. That's exactly what I'm looking for is there. Right? Because, because, so you see, this conditioning changes the probability a little bit, right? Because once I know the first one's red, you've only got 51 cards left. And you know that 26 of them are still black. So it's going to be exactly like that, which uh, turns out to be, uh, I think, 13 over 51 if you reduce the uh, fractions. Yeah. So, and then if you were asked to give this as a decimal, you would just compute the decimal. Figure out how that works. Any questions about that? Let's do another one. Um, this one's kind of a word problem. So let's say, I don't know if these numbers are accurate, but 10% of UVic students are, I don't know if it's higher than this or not, but let's say Victoria Royals fans. If you don't know what this is, it's the hockey team. I mean, if this is accurate, then possibly 90% of you don't know who this, what this is. How many of you have ever heard of the Victoria Royals? Okay, a lot more than 10%. <laughs> but you might not be fans, right? Okay, so, uh, so let's say 80% of, um, you know, Victoria Royals fans, <coughs> know what a marmot is. The mascot is a marmot. So. Uh, okay, so, and, uh, and, and only 60% of non-fans know what a marmot is. We've got a bit of data. Uh, now, let's say we pick a random student. So this is like part A of the question. Pick a random UVic student. So what is the probability? That they are they are a Royals fan and they know what a marble is. Several different uh, different kind of problems here, but yeah. So let's uh, let's just, let's say I so you know just to save time, so I don't have to write out what the events are. Let's say I just call this event R. So the event <laughs> that the random student is a Royals fan is R, um, and the event that they know what a marmot is is M. So we're trying to compute. The probability of uh, well, actually, can anyone tell me what we're computing the probability of? Yep. Yep. Okay. 
So given your data here, like, um, the way that this data is presented, I think it's, it, it's hopefully kind of clear that, like, there's two ways I can break this up, right? I could break this up as uh, probability of M, and probability of R given M. Or I could just say it's probability of R times probability of M given R, right? But you, you really got to look at what your what that is given to you. Like I mean, this is this thing here is literally saying that the probability of R is 0 0.1, right? And what this is telling you is that the probability of M given R is 0 0.8. So if we're just trying to interpret what, we're, what we've been told. So that makes it pretty clear how I should break this up, right? I should do R first, because I'm given that information. And then probability of M given R. Like I said, it's valid to write it the other way around. But you just don't have the useful information that you need, right? We're not given that, and we're not given that, so good luck to, to, to do it this way. Then we just fill in our information here, 0 0.1 times 0 0.8, which I guess is uh, 0 0.08. The 0 0.1 came from the 10%, this came from the 80%. Actually, I should have asked, how many of you know what a marm is? <coughs> okay, <laughs> most people know what a marm is, okay, good to know. Um, okay. Okay, next, uh, what, what's the probability that uh, that you're not, they're not a fan and they know what a marble is, let's say. So what is the probability, let's say, what is the probability that they're not a fan and they know what a marble is? This is going to be similar. We're going to break this up as the probability of the complement of R times the probability of M given the complement of R. So the probability they're not a fan times the probability they know what a marmot is given they're not a fan. Does anyone see what I should substitute for the first part? Yeah. Uh, you should just do like 1 minus 0 0.1. Yeah. Because, you know, 10% people are fans and 90% are not fans, right? Okay, and then the second one, I think it's kind of clear from the, the stuff that you're given. It should be 0.6, because, uh, yeah. The probability you know what a marmot is given that you're not a fan is 0.6. Uh, so, so your answer is about... 54%. Now let's say for C, uh, what's the probability that this random student knows what a marmot is? This is now saying nothing about whether they're a fan or not. Okay. I'll give you a hint here. Using part A and B, you can get this pretty quickly. Yeah. 
Well, so I wouldn't, so in this case I wouldn't subtract because, but, but you definitely do want to add these up. So, so I'm trying to compute like probability of n, right? And adding these up is the right thing because if you think about it, what's the probability of m? Well, it's the probability of m, well, let's say <coughs> r intersect m plus the probability of r prime intersect m. Because if you think about it, this, this event m is broken into, like, everything in m is either in r or not in r, right? If you think of the Venn diagram of m and r. This part would be r intersect m. This would be r prime intersect m. And that nicely covers m. Everything's either not in r or in r. That's in m. So, so 0 0.08 plus 0 0.54, so 0 0.62. Questions about that last bit? So n is just the stuff that's in n and in r, or the stuff that's in n and isn't in r. Right, you, could, you could also kind of, uh, you could, just to, to really, I don't know, um, well, maybe you wouldn't need to. I'm just kind of thinking, you can kind of draw like a little Venn diagram, right? So this part is 0.08, that part's 0.54. What would I want for the whole of M? Right, this is M, you would add these up. sometimes that this idea that, so we, we're just looking at conditional independence um, things for like, for two events, E and F. Um, you can also use conditional independence to determine the uh, probability of the intersection of three events or four events or five events. Um, so note, uh, similar formulas work for any number of events. So for example, the probability of you know, the intersection of three events, A, B, and C, is the probability of A times the probability of B given A times the probability of C given A and B. Yep. Can you uh, redefine conditional independence? Ah, uh, I haven't actually, I haven't even defined it yet. So. You used it a moment ago. Uh, you did. Don't think so. I mean. I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've talked about independence yet, but. Uh, but we will we will get there pretty soon. So, right. So uh, for for three or more events, I mean, this formula again, if you kind of reason it out, it makes sense. What's the probability that all of these things happen? Well, in order for all three of those things to happen, a has to happen, you know, a has to occur, and then you want to say, okay, if I already know a occurs, what's the probability b occurs given that a occurs? Okay, that's that. And now at this point, we know that we're assuming A and B are both occurring. And we want to figure out the probability of C uh, given A and B. Right. So, and, and 
And actually, so before we got, for, for two events, we had two formulas, right? And here you're going to have like six formulas, because you could do A and then B and then C, or you could do A and then C and then B, or B and then A and then C, all these different combinations. And basically, if you ever had a problem like this, like this you would kind of look at the data you have, and uh, that would just decide the order, right? If somebody gave you the probability of A in the question, you probably want to start with that. And then figure out, have they given me D given A or C given A, and, and so on. Yeah? Sorry, I can't quite see from here. You're just adding all those probabilities together at the end. Oh, in this part, the second year, or? Well, they're probably oh. planning to do a little bit more, uh, more variables. Um, so it's not adding. So you're always going to be multiplying. and just So if you had four different variables, you would, um, yeah, you'd have four, like, four factors that you're multiplying together. So it'd be like A and then B given A, C given A and B, D given A and B and C. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of telling you sort of one region of your Venn diagram. If you wanted multiple regions, you would you would then add up the problem. You would add up these things. So. Yeah? Would you kind of like break that into like the first formula? Because you'd find like A intersect B and then you'd do like the probability of C. Yeah, you can totally think of it like that. Yeah, that's that's that is pretty much what's going on. It's, you're kind of you got the first formula happening, and then it's like extending that by one step. Kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, in case it is useful to you at some point. Another sort of note. Actually, maybe I should maybe I should check your intuition on this. So suppose I say if I take the probability of B given A plus the probability of the complement of B given A, I guess my question is, is there any guess what that should equal. So what I'm saying is, given that A has occurred, what's a, so we're saying this is the probability B occurs given that A occurs, plus the probability B doesn't occur given that A occurs. Yeah. Oh, pretty close. Yeah. It'll just be one. It'll just be one because, yeah. But the way you kind of derive that, it'll involve two things that add up to the probability of A, but then it gets divided by the probability of A. Yeah, because if I know that A occurs, and I say, what, what's the probability B occurs, and then add that to the probability of B doesn't occur, well, always B either occurs or doesn't occur, so it should be, you know, one. And so, yeah, so the kind of, so the kind of reason, you just substitute your, your formulas, so this is equal to probability B intersect A, over probability of A plus probability of B complement intersect A over probability of A. Um, and as we saw here, very similar principle here, you can combine these on the numerator to get probability of A and yeah, it, uh, it becomes one. Any questions about that? Okay, so now we're going to get into independence. I, I, it's possible I may have let, it, let the word slip at some point. I may have said independence, but, um, but now we're going to formally say what it means. Let's just do a, a really simple example to kind of understand the concept of independence. So, I mean, flip two coins. Uh, e is the event that the first is heads, and F is the event 
put the second as heads. So I think we're pretty confident that <coughs> if it's a fair coin, the probability of that is going to be a half, right? What if I wanted to know the probability of f given e? So if I already know the first one's ahead, yeah? Yeah, and that's very much the concept of independence. That, yeah, I mean, uh, this is something which, which is always hard to explain to like a young child, right? If I like flip like five heads in a row, still the, the next one's got a 50-50 chance of being heads or tails. It's not more likely to be tails now. So, uh, so yeah, you're right. Exactly. The whether or not the first one was heads is totally irrelevant to uh, determining the second one's heads. And that's, that is this concept of independence. So, uh, so when, when we say that things are independent, it's that uh, the probability of f is equal to the probability of f given e. Um, and there's a sort of reverse condition that e also doesn't depend on f. But yeah, when, you, when we talk about independence, you want to think it's independent if like the two things are really Kind of irrelevant. They don't affect each other. So two events, E and F, are independent. If the probability of f given e is equal to the probability of f, and the probability of e given f is the probability of e. Okay, so you kind of need it to go both ways. And it's clear here that it would go both ways, right? The, yeah. the second point doesn't affect the first, and the first doesn't affect the second. Also, if you, you kind of plug in the, um, the formula for conditional independence, you can also get a third condition here. So, um, so let's say I call this equation one and two. So if I use one and the formula. says is that the probability of E intersect F over probability of F is equal to probability of E. Yeah? So um, I'm a little confused. You're using this the formula for conditional independence is is the that's the term you're using. Oh is it Did conditional I say independence or conditional independence? Oh sorry, I should be saying conditional probability here. I might be saying I might keep saying conditional independence. I, if I if I haven't been saying that, I apologize. So what I mean to say is using equation one and the formula for conditional probability. So sorry. This is conditional probability. But yeah, thanks. Thanks for catching that. I haven't had much sleep lately. <laughs> It's. Okay, so then, so then this can be rearranged, right? So, uh, so 
if I rearrange this, it says that the probability of E intersect F equals probability of E times probability of F. So let's say I call that equation three. Actually, uh, we're going to see, uh, that's exactly what I was going to kind of address right now. Okay. This, this is the, the definition given in your textbook, but it turns out that if one of them holds, then the other must hold, and this one must hold, and they're all kind of the same thing. So, so you know, if any of the like if even just one of these equations holds, then all of them <coughs> So to check for independence, this time I do mean independence. So to check if E and F are independent, um, it is enough to check, uh, you know, just one of these equations. Okay. And depending on the problem you're given, one might be more convenient than the other, or the others. Okay. So if I've got two, two events and I check equation three, and I see, ah, it doesn't hold, then I can say it's not independent. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, holding means that the left hand side equals the right hand side. Yeah. So if you're able, let's say you can compute all three of these things in, in equation three, and the left hand side doesn't equal the right hand side, then you're like not independent. If it does equal the right, left hand side does equal the right hand side, then you can say it is independent. And same with any of these two. So you might be able to, maybe you'll have a problem where it's easier to compute this and this, then it is to compute these things. And then you want to check this equation. If it holds, you're good. If it's not, you're not. Yep. How are we checking if it holds? Because I'm using like, the left side to compute the right side. So if you're, if you're asked, is it independent, what you would want to do is you like compute this value, and then separately compute that value. And if you get two different numbers, then they're not equal. right? And then you can say not independent. So you're not, so if you're asked if something is independent, you don't use this formula. You try to check this formula if it's true or not. That makes sense. You would use this, suppose I gave you a problem where I give you the information, the, assume these two things are independent, then you can then you can use this as much as you want, basically. So if you know they're independent, you can use this. Uh, you're trying to show they're not independent, you need to show that this doesn't hold. And might we be given the facts that would tell us that these are don't hold? Yep, yep. Or you might have to compute them yourself. Like, you know, you might be able to compute this and compute that and compute that uh, using techniques we've done earlier and then just check the equation at the end. So that, that would be a longer problem. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Sorry, question not really related to the material. Um, what will the quiz midterm frame cover of itself? Uh, I don't remember, but it's on price space. If you go under test, six one three. Okay, I'm six one three. So yeah, not this stuff. Then. Um, but by the way, next week you have a you have a test on Wednesday. There's also still a quiz on Tuesday. So every Tuesday there's a quiz. Uh, so don't forget about that. Quizzes on my lap map as usual. Okay, so let's do a quick um, a quick example where I will just give you the numbers. So, or, or actually, yeah. So let's say, let's suppose E and F. Some uh, controversy about. <laughs> okay, well, suppose E and F are independent events. Such that the probability of E is 0 0.2. And probability of that is 0 0.6. And then what is the probability of the intersection? Um, so this is one of those situations where you would use the formula. So you're not trying to check if the formula holds or not. Because we're, I've given you the information that they are independent, and so this means you're allowed to use the formula, right? So this is a fairly easy one if you know the formula and you know what it's asking for. So because they're independent, this is true, and then you can just plug in. Uh, 0 0.2 and 0 0.6, and you get 0 0.12. And for that equation, it's because we know that e given f is still equal to e, that we just multiply the two? Well, I guess, so this one, I'm, I mean, technically you can use that one, but, uh, yeah, I'm using this. Here. Oh, sorry, I thought we were doing the additional probability. Yeah. So you can, you can use any of these things. I mean, to be honest, you can, you can use this and you'll get the same answer, but it'll just take you an extra step to basically derive this and then use it. Another one, let's say we uh, deal three cards. So let's say E is the event that they're all red. F is the event that they're all different denominations. Denominations are like ace, two, up to ten, jack, queen, king, right? And now the question is, are these events Feel like these should be independent or not? So who thinks they who thinks they sound like independent events? And who thinks they're not independent? And then some people don't have an opinion yet, which is okay. 
I would have thought these were independent too, but they're not, strangely. Uh, which we can we can do by just computing things. But yeah, the, it turns out they're not independent. So you really have to be careful with these things. It can sometimes be a bit uh, misleading or counterintuitive. Okay. So to check whether they're independent, we just have to check any of these three formulas. Um, maybe it's not clear which one which one's easiest. But let me let me just start by computing something because I mean. Like the probability of E is in at least two of these formulas. Let's, let's pick you the probability of E. Uh, so so the probability of E, again, we all possibilities are equally likely to pick three cards in a unordered way. So note that these events don't care, they don't care which order you pick the cards. So we might as well do unordered selection. So it's 50 choose, two, uh, 50 choose three on the bottom, 26 choose three on the top. Um, okay. Let's now let's let's check equation three. So. What's the probability of F? So I'm again going to want to divide by, um, going to want to divide by 52 choose 3. So to get three denominations, I've got 13 choices of denominations. I'm going to pick three of them. So let's say I pick two, five, and Okay. And then after picking the three de denominations, like I still have to decide for, for my two or whatever, is it which of the four suits is it? So for the first one, I've got four choices of suit. For the second, I have four choices of suit. And then I've got four choices of suit. So it's four choose one, four choose one, four choose one, or four times four times four. Okay, let's now compute this. Probability of E intersect that. So I want to say what's what's the probability of getting how many ways can I get uh, three different denominations and all my cards are red? It's kind of the same as what we did here actually. Except, so we pick three denominations. And when we, the, the only difference is when we pick the suit, there's only two choices instead of four choices. Right? So pick the suit, two choices, two choices, two choices. Or sorry, pick, sorry, pick the denominations, 13 choose three. Uh, and then three ways, two ways to pick the first suit, second suit, third suit. And um, it might not be completely clear, but if you put all of these things in your calculator, if you multiply these two, it's not going to give you the same number as this one. So this one, like this one's about 0 0.1035. And if I take, so I'll just quickly write this in, probability of E times probability of F, if you do that in your calculator, it'll be about 0 0.0974. Okay, so they're not equal, therefore not independent. So the answer is no. Okay. 